I need a volunteer who wants to come play a game. Not all at once, I'm not joking. You can't move on until somebody volunteers. All right, come on, Stacey. Let me let me let me let me set up. You're the next contestant on the prize this round. We are going to play a game that you may have seen on the Price is Right. I think of all of the um, <laughs> I think of all the game shows that have been around for a long time. Uh, the Price is Right may be the most truly like multi generational. You know, you, how many you grew up watching that with grandma in our, in our living room? And you didn't have to be smart like Jeopardy or, you know, it was just kind of just stood the test of time. So we're going to play a little pricey right this morning. The game is high low, okay? And have you ever seen that game? But well, we have six items. Uh, we have a container of Mio. This is a drink mix you put in your water bottle. Uh, we have Oreos. You know what Oreos are, right? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> we have a jar of Alfredo sauce, a box of pretty pebbles. These are, um, Dehydrated onion flakes that you might use to season some chicken or whatever, and then a bag of tortilla chips that don't want to stand up very well. So, all you have to do is you're going to pick what you think are the three most expensive items. Okay, and if you pick correctly, then you win a prize. So, item number one that you think is one of the three most expensive items. She says the Alfredo sauce. So, we're going to turn that over. The Alfredo sauce is. $4.99, all right? That's good, that's good. All right, we have two more. What else do you think is at the top of the list? We have a pack of Oreo cookies. The Oreo cookies come in at $5.49, good, good. We have one more item. I know this is hard because it's like 80% more than we played the game last year, so it's hard to even guess what things cost with it today. Oh, get some feedback from the crowd. We're going to go with the Mio, and the Mio is $6.99. Yeah, seems good. That seems good. So you win a prize if all three of these items are less than $4.99. Okay? How do we think you did? Good, bad, good. Right. We got the box of pretty pebbles. $3.99. Good. So far, so good. We have the onion flakes. Oh. And then let's see, the tortilla chips were six fifty nine. Yeah. You were. Give Stacy a big round of applause. So the purpose of that game, um, besides having a little bit of fun, is really quite simple. Uh, in our world, in our culture, everything has a price tag, right? Uh, if you want to, so we're going to skip over that video that's in there. So if you just want to go put me back on the next title slide so we don't get off track here. Everything has a price. And we spend most of our lives playing this game. The game is this. If I want to purchase that, I have to save enough money and then I can pay the price, right? And so whether if you're a little kid and you want to buy a pack of baseball cards at the grocery store and you save your allowance money and you go in and you, you buy the pack of cards with the bubble gum in it and you have that moment of, ah, oh, I got to buy my thing. Or you're a young couple and you're dreaming of buying your first home and you're putting money back and putting money back so you've got that down payment. Or you're, you know, a little better off in life, you're doing well, and man, that convertible sure seems like it looks nice down there on the street corner. I, I could save up 18 grand for that or whatever the, the price tag might be. And so that's the deal. We look at the price tag, we save the money, we earn the money, we work hard, we invest the money, and then when we have enough money, to pay the price, we buy a bigger and more. Our text today is found in Psalm chapter 49, if you want to turn there. Psalm chapter 49. And at the heart of this text, and at the heart of our message this morning in this truth, there is at least one thing in life that you cannot purchase. That you will never make enough money, you will never make enough good investments, you will never work enough hours, you will never put enough back in the, the bank account to be able to afford that there's something in life that simply cannot be purchased. And so we're going to look at Psalm 49. We're going to walk through this passage together as he talks about death. And he uses this word called redeem. To redeem something means to buy it back. To purchase it from someone so that it can be your possession. We're going to pick up reading together here in verse 5. 
He says, why should I fear in times of trouble? I went too far. The iniquity of my foes surround me. They trust in their wealth and boast in their abundant riches. Yet these cannot redeem a person or pay his ransom to God. Since the price of redeeming him is too costly, one should forever stop trying, so he may live forever and not see the pain. This is essentially what's being said here in the psalm. You are not capable of purchasing your own life. That you are not capable of redeeming your own life. He uses the phrase ransom to God. And he said, you should just stop trying to think that you can somehow be good enough, save enough, earn enough. It doesn't matter if you make a million dollars a year or a million dollars a minute. It doesn't matter if you do a thousand good deeds. It doesn't matter how many animals you sacrifice. You cannot do it. It is impossible. You cannot pay the price that is owed. So you should simply stop trying. For you cannot redeem your own life. And it's an interesting turn of phrase because in the Old Testament, there are a couple of examples of redeeming a human life. For example, you may not know this, but you had to, if you were a Jewish person, you had to redeem your firstborn son. Because of the way that the Jews got set free from slavery, because of the way God had protected the people, written into their covenant, the relationship between God and his people, was the idea that the oldest son in every family belonged to God. And if you wanted him back, you had to offer an animal sacrifice in his place and redeem him. We see this take place in the book of Luke. Remember Joseph and Mary show up at the temple with their two small birds and they kill the birds in the temple and redeem Jesus? That was something every Jewish person did. They had to buy their son's life back from God. The other place we see this is there were certain crimes you would commit that came with a capital punishment. That if you had broken the law in a certain way, stolen so much money, damaged so much property, killed somebody else's livestock, they would kill you for it. They usually drag you outside and throw rocks at you until you were dead, which I don't think you ever thought about doing that to some kids once in a while. <laughs> Let's say you could do that to rebellious people, right? for the record. And sometimes, rather than pay with your life, you could make restitution. That if I had accidentally killed your oxen, I could buy you two in its place, and I could give you two back instead of my own life, and I could redeem my life from death. But I didn't have to die, I could make this other payment instead. So if there are these examples of being able to redeem life, being able to save yourself from death, then why does our psalmist say, you cannot redeem your life, you cannot pay the ransom for God? What's the difference? And the answer is simple. Those other examples are temporary, right? If you redeem your son's life, you buy him another 40, 50, 60, 80 years, they're still going to die, right? They, they get to maybe live a long life and get married and raise kids and go to Cedar Point and ride roller coasters and all that fun stuff. But they're still going to die. You're just prolonging it. Even if you redeem your own life, you've committed some crime where you deserve to be killed for it, you make restitution, you ransom your life back. You're just putting off the inevitable. If you're still going to die eventually, you might buy yourself another decade or two or three. You might get to see your grandkids grow up. But death is still coming for you. But what the psalmist is saying here is not that there's nothing you can do when a mistake has happened. He's saying that it doesn't matter how important you are. It doesn't matter how wealthy you are. It doesn't matter how smart you are. You and I have the same problem. His name is death. There's absolutely nothing you can do. He says it pretty clearly as we keep reading here. Let's keep working through our psalm. He says, For one can see that wise men die, and the foolish and senseless also pass away. Then they leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their eternal homes, their homes from generation to generation, though they have named the states after themselves. I just want you to get that picture. Do you know anybody who's got their name on the side of the building? Maybe a, a building in a campground or a building, a, a business building, their, their name is plastered up there, but the reality is it's not their home anymore. Their home is in a cemetery somewhere with a stone, with a little tiny grave, right? And no matter how successful they were, no matter how much money they made, no matter how wise or foolish they were, the grave is their destiny. For despite his assets, man will not last. Here, this is encouraging. He is like animals that perish. 
This is the way of those who are arrogant and of the followers who approve their work. Like sheep, they are headed for Sheol. Death will shed them. The upright will rule over them in the morning, and a form will waste away in Sheol, far from the rock. But this is the destiny of all people. And we can pretend and put it off and prolong it, but we need to live in full awareness that one day I'm coming to your funeral, and you're coming to mine. That's the only way the story is. So the way I see it, you live in light of that reality. You have one of two approaches you can take in life. Approach number one is you can determine that I'm going to get as much as I possibly can out of my time on this earth. That if I only have 20 years or 40 years or 80 years or 100 years, then I should soak up as much as I can. This style of living was made famous in the movie Dead Poet Society, where Robin Williams told his boys, Seize the day. A little less Latin, a little less epic. Current generation of things is YOLO. You only live once, right? It's the same sentiment, just two different generations way of expressing it. They both mean the same thing. You don't have much time. You're not promised tomorrow or next week or next, next month, so get as much out of this life as you can. Suck the marrow out of life. Enjoy every single moment. Ride the roller coaster, go skydiving, climb the mountain, go to the beach, try the new food, go out on the deck. Do everything that this life happens because eventually you're going to die and it's all going to be gone, so you might as well enjoy it while you're here. That is one attitude of living. There are people who live that. Paul referenced them even in scripture. He's a reference these scholars who said, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Right? That is one option for life. When you live in the recognition that someday death is coming to you, you can choose to make everything about this life as much money, as much pleasure, as much success, as much power, as much enjoyment as I can possibly soak up because I don't know how long I have. Card baby, seize the day. You only live once, make the most of it. Or, or you keep reading. The verse 15 says this that God will redeem my life. Power of Jehovah, or he will train. But God will redeem my life from the power of Sheol, or he will take it. You need to know that Sheol here in the Hebrew train of thought simply means the realm of death. It doesn't necessarily mean heaven, it doesn't necessarily mean hell, it just simply means the realm of death. For God will redeem, he will buy back my life from the power of the realm of death. He will take it. I was listening to a podcast this week, and a guy was talking about all the things that have changed over the church in the last six or seven years, and how these small little changes have had dramatic effects. And he said something I'd never heard anybody mention before. He said, one of the changes that we don't talk about, but I think it's had a radical impact on the church, because we've gotten rid of church cemeteries. I thought, that's interesting. I don't hear what he had to say. You see, remember all those little country churches, right? Some of them are still around. They've got 30 or 40 tombstones out back in the yard. I grew up next to ones of it in a parsonage. We used to play hide and seek in the cemetery. I know that's a little weird, but it's true. It's a little messed up in the head. A little. Just a little. <laughs> this point to this there was a time and a place where every Sunday morning you walked into church, and whether consciously or subconsciously, you knew that the reason you were there was because we had a problem with that. You knew that one day you were going to end up there next to Grandma Betsy and Uncle Joe, the stone just like this. And the reason we gathered in church and the reason we sang songs and the reason we proclaimed the gospel is because there's nothing we could do to fix that problem. But we believe in a God who sent his son to hang on a cross, to face death, to stare it square in the eyes, and to walk out of the tomb three days later and go, death has no power anymore. You don't need to fear that anymore because you can't buy your life back. You'll never be able to afford the price, but it has been paid. But God will redeem you from Sheol. Well, he will take you three days. And death will have no power over you. And sometimes we think that the purpose of gathering here is so we can have happier lives now. 
that everything can be pretty and, and wonderful and prosperous now. You just make me feel good. So I can listen, we gather because we have a problem with sin and we have a problem with death. And without the cross of Jesus Christ, we have no hope. It's the price we cannot pay. And the reason the gospel is so important is because our only hope is in a God who faced death and walked up the other side and said, if you'll place your faith in me, if you'll follow me, to be baptized and risen to new life in me, then there is hope beyond death. Death has the power of the good man. I like to think about it this way. There's an old story about a dad who was riding down the road, a country road with his son in the car. It was a hot summer day and they had the windows cracked halfway down and a bee flies into the car and begins to buzz around. And this little 10 year old boy, he begins to freak out because he is deathly allergic to bees. So last time he got stung, he got rushed to the ER and had to get a shot and he's panicking because here's this bee, they're in the middle of nowhere, if this bee stings him, he doesn't know what's gonna happen, he's terrified. And finally the dad reaches over and grabs the bee in the palm of his hand and holds the bee tight. And after a minute or so, it's ah! He shakes his hand and the bee flies out. The boy starts panicking and the bee is flying around the car once again. The dad looks at his son and says, you have nothing to be afraid of. See, there's a sting. I've taken a sting. He can't hurt you again. Is this not what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15? Where of death is your victory? Where of death is your sting? But thanks be to God who gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Is that not what he says? Death still buzzes around. Our physical bodies one day, whether you like to talk about it or not, are still going to die. Some of you woke up this morning thinking today might be the day, right? You find out of bed like, I don't know if I'm going to make it today. <clears throat> it still buzzes around and makes a mess of things. The stinger is taken away. It can't hurt you anymore. For Christ has faith in death and has conquered death and lives again. He says, all who come to me, all who follow me, will receive new life. Death has no power to you. His faith is gone. My father used to tell me when we would do prayerless time. I remember him telling me this dozen times often in regards to my life. Many of you know my dad was sick for much of my childhood, in and out of the hospital, uh, multiple procedures and surgeries. We'd every time we would go to pray for people and ask them to get better. We'd say something that sounds kind of morbid, but it's true. And I've, I've shared it with some of you in the hospital room. So the only way we ever really get better is with Jesus. Everything else is just belonging to God. He'd come to my office and say, hey, we got really bad test results. I've got stage three cancer. I've got chemo coming up and radiation. We pray for them. And we pray for healing. And it's entirely possible, because I've seen God do it countless times, that you come back three months later and the cancer's all gone. But you're not better. You might get another 10 years. You might get another 20 years. You might get another 50 years. But you're not better. Because if it's not the cancer, then it's going to be a heart attack when you're 65. And if it's not a heart attack when you're 65, then it's going to be a car accident when you're driving down the hall at highway. And best case scenario, you'll be like my great grandfather, who was 93 years old. He went out to check the cattle one day, put hay in the field, drove back, looked at my great grandma, and said, Hey, I'm going to throw another way down and take a nap, and never woke up. But if it's not one thing, it's going to be the other. And so one of the things my dad taught me from a young age is that this life is not what we cling to. This life is not what we make everything our pursuit about. This life is not what we spend our energy on because this life is fleeting. And maybe you'll get 100 years, or maybe you'll get 25. And maybe it'll be cancer, or a car accident, or heart disease, or whatever. But one day, you're going to have to face death. There are only two options. Well, I lived a good life. Now I'm in trouble. Or, my God has used the power of sin. He paid the price. And I don't fear death. I'm not anxious about death. 
I'm eager and excited for the day I can believe it. The depth ceases to be the end. It's simply a gateway to paradise. It doesn't look like it. So my father's funeral, we sang a song we're going to sing for invitation today. We sang three just celebratory praise songs, one of which we're going to sing for invitation today. We began our service singing when we all get to heaven, and the end of the course says, we'll sing and shout for victory, right? When we all get to heaven someday, we'll sing and shout for victory. We don't have to wait until we get to heaven to sing and shout for victory. We already know that death is in hell. We already know this thing has been taken away. We can sing and shout for victory today. So my father's turn was saying these words. O oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me before I knew him. And so all my love is now. He plunged me to victory in the victory of love. So we're going to sing that together now. The victory we have in Christ over death, over sin, over the sting that comes with the world. And we're going to proclaim that in Christ we have victory. And I just want to invite you, if you do not yet have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that you've been pursuing option number one, that I'm going to suck as much as I can out of this life, I'm going to get as much as I can, and I don't know what I'm going to do when the day comes that I die. I want to talk to you before you get to that. Because the only hope we have is in Jesus Christ. The victory is in Jesus. Father, we come to this moment, and I recognize that in this room there's all sorts of grief. So many of us have lost grandparents and parents and spouses and children. And we share the, the, just the overwhelming grief that comes with not being able to see the people that we love. The heartache that comes with not being able to talk to the people who meant so much to us. And yet in the midst of that grief, we proclaim this truth. The victory in you. Death has no power. For you have paid the price. You have bought us we are good. Cannot. Father, receive our praise and proclaim that truth this morning.